I'm not someone who is very good at offending people. Well, maybe I am, but not deliberately. <laughs> not deliberately uh, yeah. That's to say, I, I, being rude or, you know, sort of making people gasp is not quite my thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably my mother's fault. She always brought me up to be excessively polite. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's that, that, that makes us feel comfortable. I usually yeah. 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 We enjoy it. We, yes. we do like yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And after all, you used correctly the word host. Well, actually, you used the word host, but um, I assume you meant host. <laughs> um, How and, comfortable are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is, it, I feel like a host. So at the moment I'm thinking, yes. as a host would, who's got a party on Sunday, oh, I hope the phone's not going to ring, as it were, and I hear that they're not coming. The guests they're are not, not going to They're not yeah, coming. Yeah. And what's great about this year is, uh, with the exception of only two people, all the major nominees are coming. In some cases, okay. 6,000 miles from uh, Los Angeles or 3,000 from New York or from around Britain. Mm. Um, but only two can't make it, and that's, that, that's because they're working uh -huh, elsewhere. Uh -huh. And that's a great testament, I think, to how BAFTA, and that's nothing to do with me, but how BAFTA has become a very important fixture yes. in the calendar. Yeah, absolutely, and we will we talk it. more about the BAFTAs a little bit mm. later on. But first, it seems that barely a week goes by without news of another online scam, and there are no lengths to which these cyber criminals won't go to get their hands on our cash. We sent Dan to meet those fooled by the latest convincing con. The stock market's no longer just the playground of city traders. Now all you need is the internet to start trading. You can even do it in your own home. There are scores of websites out there claiming easy profits for wannabes willing to take the plunge. But there's no such thing as a dead cert, especially if someone stacked the odds against you. Former teacher Lindsay Tanner Elwell has learned that to her cost. She's no fool. She's been trading successfully online for the past few years. It was something I could do at home as I was then coming into retirement and I didn't have a terrific pension. So I was looking really to earn an extra income. And a website called The Brit Method seemed to offer just the thing. It says its boss, Jason Taylor, designed a software program that does all the trading for you. The site even has a live feed of successful trades and videos by users who say the software really works. 482,000. £118 in the first month, and I'm simply blown away. Convinced, Lindsay paid in £300 to begin trading on the currencies market, but she soon learned Jason Taylor's profit guarantee was worthless. To say that he is 100% successful is, is a, a lie. You're gradually losing more and more and more, and then you will get the automated mails asking you to top up again. What happened when you contacted them? What was their response? You don't get a response. Sadly, the Brit method's not the only trading software out there failing to deliver. This is Ultimate for Trading. It says its groundbreaking system has helped 50,000 traders increase their investment tenfold. Its boss has even appeared on an American talk show. There are a limited number of positions, and we expect the hype to be very, very high for this. But senior investments analyst Laith Kalaf is unimpressed. He says these websites trade in something called binary options, and each trade is just a bet. Binary options trading asks you to bet money on the direction of a very unpredictable market, either up or down. And depending on whether you get that bet right, you're either going to make money or you're going to lose money. Um, so it's a really, really risky way of trading. Ultimate for Trading offers a chance to try before you buy with a free demo version of their trading software. Any profits and losses are purely virtual, but Lath agrees to give it a go. Surprise, surprise, we've won. And our Midas Touch holds good throughout the free trial. We've won close to a grand and we've only been sitting here less than five minutes. But what this is really doing is suggesting that you can simply make profits time after time after time in a matter of seconds. You simply can't do that on the trading markets. And it's not just the guaranteed profits that are bogus. This isn't a real talk show, and this man isn't really the company boss. He is a businessman, but his only real TV appearance has been a pitch on Dragon's Den. He told us he has nothing to do with Ultimate for Trading, and he had simply taken an acting role in what he believed was a fictional promotional tool. He says he's shocked it's been used to mislead investors. 
Disclaimers have now been added to the Ultimate Four Trading website, but only after we contacted them. And remember the Brit method? Well, boss Jason Taylor doesn't exist. This photo pops up on lots of websites, and it's likely the model has no idea how it's being used. And what about those positive online reviews? Well, Lindsay's in for another shock. That successful DIY trader's actually an actor. I feel angry with myself that I was so taken in. I feel I've a, a fool, a latter fool. The actor told us he had no idea his testimonial was being used to scam anyone. We contacted the Brit method, but we've had no response. In the meantime, if you're thinking of becoming a DIY trader, take a tip from a pro. If you come across a website which is offering you profits without any risk, then be very, very, very cautious, because that just doesn't exist. It's all too common, that phrase, isn't mm. it? It sounds too good to be true. It mm. probably is. And listen, if you do want to check whether a trading company is legitimate, uh, we've put some links on our website with, uh, with some advice. Hopefully it will be able to help. So this Sunday, you're hosting the BAFTAs. You've seen pretty much all of the films. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have. At this stage, do you know winners? No, no, absolutely so not. They're all in sealed envelopes and it's all controlled by, yeah, these sort of auditing and accounting companies. It's incredibly serious. Right. Uh, under lock and key and, um, you know, in, in the late afternoon as the, yes. as the event uh, uh, pr uh, comes, you, you see these huge burly guards standing next to the table where the envelopes are put out for the presenters to open and read oh, the winner. Fantastic. And so when you're presenting, are you still no unaware? Idea. No So it's idea. a surprise for you to... Oh, Joke. how wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, two films have got nine nominations, so it's kind of unlikely. Mm. Do you think that one will sweep the board, or could that happen? It's unlikely, but it, you never know, and that's the thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And most bookies are offering very short odds indeed on, uh, on Leonardo DiCaprio for mm. Best Actor, who mm -hmm. is very much the hot favourite. And Dame Maggie Smith. I mean, she could, she could make history, couldn't she? Because she has five already, so do you think she could go one better? If she does, she'll be the most honoured, decorated BAFTA winner of, of all yes, time, yes. of either gender. Should be quite something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, war ceremonies um, have been making headlines, haven't they? Particularly the Oscars, for mm. kind of the wrong reasons to do with diversity. Mm. What, what do you make of all of that? What's your opinion? It's immensely thorny business. Uh, um, you know, films of, of all art forms, you know, really should and do reflect. The, the totality of human experience, uh, both mm -hmm. fantasy, of course, and superheroes, as well as the dark lives of many. Um, and uh, I think m most of us would, would recognise that things have got better, mm. but that also maybe they haven't got as good as they should be. As it happens with the BAFTAs, we're giving the fellowship this year to mm -hmm. Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. That was decided last year. It's, it's nothing to do with the current uh, sort of uh, frenzy over the business of diversity. Yeah. Uh, and he is a black American actor who has forged a fantastic uh, uh, position for himself and for other black actors behind him with immense strength and dignity and passion and power. Uh, and so we're very proud to be doing that. And it's a coincidence that it happens to be a year yeah, in which this yeah. whole issue has, has, has arisen. But uh, I think the most important thing is that BAFTA does an enormous amount of work mentoring young people to make films, to write scripts, uh, mm -hmm. bringing them together with established filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be the new generations of filmmakers making stories about their lives that is going to make sure that they can then become BAFTA members. Because if BAFTA members t are predominantly white and middle class, it's because they have been the filmmakers of yesteryear. Yeah, uh, and and you can't actually expect BAFTA to go into the middle of the cities and say you can be a BAFTA, uh, you can be an Academy member, you can be a, you have to be a, a filmmaker to be an Academy yeah. uh, member. Um, but there'll be young people coming on who are, and they'll change, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Complexion. I mean, obviously, a huge amount of work goes in, you know, to the filmmaking and what have you. But the event itself on that evening, I mean, it can things things can take a turn for the worse. There's all <laughs> sorts of wonderful moments. Well, as far as those kind of vivid memories of oh, hang on a minute, which what, what, the one for you is what? Well, the, they tend to be slips, and it's either people right. falling over, which is oh, always hilarious. Yes, I, yes. I've always found, and don't get me wrong, women, but I've always found the, the, the female obsession with heels peculiar. I, they're uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> to me, they look preposterous. Um, <laughs> and certainly, I don't know any men who are interested in them. Only other women look at them and say, oh, have you seen her heels? <laughs> and she, <laughs> what? I mean, she, she might as well wear, you know, something coming out of your ear that's peculiar. <laughs> I mean, anyway, the, so when, when someone in extravagant heels falls over, a part of me just yes. wants to hug myself yeah. with joy. Well, listen, <laughs> we thought that we would help you try and get into the unpredictable BAFTA performance mode. Yes.
We're not going to give you any high heels at all, <laughs> but if no. you don't mind heading over to the podium, oh, yes. which yes. is awaiting you at the other end all of right. the studio. Okay. Uh, and whilst you get there, I mean, it looks quite plain at the moment, but we'll put a bit of music, oh, we'll put a yes. bit of music on, we'll change the lighting, we'll bring in an audience. Drama. And it's it's almost like we're there at the Royal Opera House. As we said, there might be some technicalities on the night, so all you have to do, Stephen, is yeah. read the words on the screen, and there might be a couple left out, so just fill in the blanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host tonight, Mr. Stephen Fry! Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, good evening, good evening, and welcome to the 69th British Academy Film Awards. What a pleasure to be back hosting yet again. I bet you're wondering how many times I've now hosted. Well, it's... Uh, Far too many times. <laughs> Frank is 11. Uh, what a year for cinema it's been, though, with huge blockbusters such as Jurassic World, in which the iconic Tyrannosaurus Rex was back, and Tyrannosaurus is, of course, ancient Greek for king, or tyrant, as we would say. So a Tyrannosaurus is a king king, because Rex is also king. There you go, Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> Um, and who could forget the new Star Wars film? I enjoyed it so much. As soon as I got home from the cinema, I watched all six of the previous Star Wars films. Of course, uh, they are uh, one. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know one, two, and three because they were so awful. But uh, four is, 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 of course, the, the Death Star one. You know, the, the original. Uh, five is uh, the best of them all: Empire Strikes Back, and six is the, uh, the Jedi. Jedi, Jedi. Uh, now, uh, let's thank the first filmmakers in history, the Lumiere brothers from France, whose first names were French and very French. <laughs> um, and also thanks to the current president of Chile, Her Excellency. I really wish I knew that. That would be that would so annoy you, but I don't. But it's been a sad year in the entertainment industry also with the shock of... Zane leaving One Direction. Uh, but all the best to the four remaining members of 1D who are <laughs> Harry Styles, I do know that one. Uh, hey! Harry Styles is awesome. For me, Harry Styles. <laughs> and four, there'll always be Harry. Now, an obvious uh, outrage is that the one show inexplicably hasn't been nominated for a BAFTA, but I'd personally like to thank the one show for consistently, reliably providing children's entertainment. <laughs> weeks and uh, it's just marvellous a primary coloured beauty and thank you all very much indeed. Brilliant. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, the BAFTAs will be broadcast on BBC One on Sunday night and lots of luck and I'm sure it'll be just like yes. that. Yes. Thank you and sorry. <laughs> Thank you and sorry. Uh, now, while Stephen uh, will be revealing the big BAFTA winners on Sunday night, one guaranteed recipient of uh, one of these... Oh, no, we actually it. have one. There we go. Just come oh, in. That's a... It is quite heavy. Oh, anyway, uh, oh, will be like a that. company who has spent over 100 years providing the acting world with their costumes, including this rather fetching outfit here uh, that Stephen donned in Wild. Looking lovely. Oh, we've sent Angela Scanlon for a rummage through the country's biggest dressing-up books. Mm. Whether it's military shirts sure enough for an army, maybe it's a little number for Abigail's party. Or perhaps something from a galaxy far, far away. It's all here under one roof. Started in 1813 as a second-hand clothing store, Angels is now the world's largest professional costume house. Getting us into character is owner and chairman, Tim Angel. How did it all start? My great-great-great-grandfather set the business up in 1840 and actors were responsible for their own clothes in those days. So when we were supplying one one day, one actor said to them, I I'd like to borrow my costume, not buy it. And my borrow is not a word that exists in the angel vocabulary okay. and hire is. So we started hiring. How many pieces are there in the, the warehouse? Approximately about a million, give or take. This happens to be one of my favourites, and it also happens to be one of the oldest. Okay. So um, what kind of era? Roughly are we about 1860s. It's roughly 150 years old. Well, this is BAFTA-nominated Lady in the Van, I'm guessing. Oh. This is a costume that wasn't made for her. Uh, there might be new pieces on it, but it was broken down to make her look like a tramp. The shoes were my mother-in-law's, so she's very happy <laughs> because she's going around telling all her friends that. Maggie Smith wore her shoes. And these, Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin, but they're actually Del Boy and Rodney. Oh. This is, I think, an iconic piece of television. It feels like these should be behind glass in a museum. You can walk through the stock and you can find bits of 
film or television history hanging on the rails. Yeah. And really what we are is the custodians of film heritage and, and television heritage over the last hundred years. A highly skilled team run things behind the scenes and the creative manager who oversees them is Tim's son, Jeremy. With 160,000 square foot, eight miles of costume, I'm embarrassed to say it's tidier than my bedroom, but is there a system? Everything here is chronological, so it goes from Edwardian all the way through, so Edwardian 1900, 1910s, and then colour and gender. Searching through all these incredible creations, it got me thinking about just how much skill is involved in making them. All of the costumes we make are all made to measure, so we have to incorporate all the different shapes and sizes that people ask. We're currently working on a show about Queen Victoria, so we're redoing some diplomatic tunics or tailcoats. So we've got an original one over here from the 1900s, but the fabric's so old it's just ripping and rotten. So we're taking all the old gold bullion off and remaking the coats. The cost of these now, if we did one completely from scratch, would be about 10,000. There's a good sense of pride in when things are finished and they go out on time and then a year and a half later you see them on screen or you see them on a bus go past and you're like, we made that. You could spend days just walking around here. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> so Tim, how does it feel to have that contribution recognised by BAFTA? Oh, it's, it's amazing. We're really, really over the moon about it because normally we're always the bridesmaid, never the bride, and we never get any recognition. It's the first one and that makes it even more special. What will you wear? I mean, you're not going to be stuck for choice in here. Eight miles of clothing over a million pieces. Well, I think I might wear black. Understated. Understated. No doubt about it. Well deserved of their uh, BAFTA award that they'll be getting on Sunday night. Absolutely. Now, many of you watching will remember that Stephen made a groundbreaking documentary about mental health and your personal struggle with it. Mm -hmm. Well, ten years on, and Stephen is making a follow-up programme for the BBC's mental health season. So let's just take a look, shall we, at a moment uh, that you spent with your psychiatrist. I have a dim memory of um, arriving here and... When you arrived, let me remind you, in, in, sorry that you were still alive. Yes, and I was. wanting to die and feeling that you should have died. Yeah. From two years ago, when, I, when we first met, despite being very depressed, you were also extremely manic in your speech. And you talked and talked and talked about yeah. what life, the purposelessness of your life, yeah. how your skills meant nothing, your talent seemed meaningless, yeah. and your future seemed hopeless. Yeah. So it was valuable to put you on the anti-manic medication and to get rid of the alcohol back at that point and look at your mood state. And I can remember that, that I was in pain, but I can't recreate it. But I remember thinking it, and I meant it. Stephen, how, how, how difficult was it for you to invite the cameras into that situation? It, it wasn't easy. The, the, the filmmaker, Ross Wilson, who, with whom I made the, a first film called Secret Life of the Manic Depressive, um, and we called it that because we wanted people to understand, and the phrase manic depression was the way it would be understood. Now, of course, we would naturally use the, the phrase bipolar mm. disorder because that's a more common uh, and, and commonly understood way. But mm. uh, I trusted Ross is the point. We'd made the first film and he was very keen and Charlotte Moore, the controller of BBC One, was very, very keen that the BBC should actively engage in helping um, spread, you know, the word about the truth of mm. what mental health is as a threat to to, to people and to families mm. and to, mm. to, to, to the country generally. And you know, I, I, I suppose if you are lucky enough, as I have been, to have had some success in the world um, and you have this problem that you've lived with, uh, it, it seems a, a small thing to share it. Okay. But it's a painful one, obviously. Yeah, it's like looking at a dark side of yourself and even watching myself yeah. then, I can see that I was less happy than I am now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a mixture of that wonderful psychiatrist, Billy, who is, who is I can honestly say, saved my life. And, of course, the love of my life, my husband, uh, who's also saved my life, I think. And, and medication, uh, mm -hmm. find, finding the right medication for me. And what I'd always want to say about mental health is, on the one hand, you have to... You have to establish how serious a problem it is if you have a, a condition like bipolar disorder, bipolar 1, which I have, um, uh, or indeed bipolar 2, or any other kind. Um, it's, it can lead to death. It can lead to certainly to self-mutilation, self-harm of the worst kind. It, 
and to suicide, but also to use of reliance on drugs and alcohol and other things to try and take you out of this terrible mood you're in to numb your mind. And that, of course, can provide a slippery slope to, mm -hmm. to, to, to more ill health and, and destruction of family connections and so on. So you want to emphasise how serious it is. But another part of me wants to shout out how you can live a full and fulfilling life, a life that is, in, in every respect, a proper life and full of love and hope and connection and all the other things. Mm -hmm. And the two are not mutually exclusive. Mm. But you have to recognise the first, the seriousness, and to try... So it helps to be diagnosed, it, I that's guess. That's exactly it, Matt. Yes, mm. it does. Um, you do an inspiring thing by talking about it um, to so many people um, who deal with these issues. Have things changed in the last ten years, do you think, since you last kind of went out there? I and really made... do think they have changed. I think they've changed enormously. I think it has entered what people like to call the, n the national conversation. People yeah. in schools. I mean, just take self-harm. I, I, I wanted to do a programme entirely about self-harm because when I was growing up at school, I'd never heard the phrase. and It didn't have any meaning. I didn't know any school friends who cut themselves, for example. I just didn't know any. No. It's, it's just not something... That, and, and I've been to schools, I give talks or whatever, and, and, and I mention self-harm and then the kids come up afterwards and they say, oh, it's, it's an epidemic here. And that's not just in schools in the inner city, say, where you might expect that some children have difficult lives, it's parents may be, may be from split families and parents mm -hmm. may have drug or issues or whatever, mm -hmm. but quite literally the most famous public school in the country, the most exclusive... I, I, I talked about... I was giving a talk about one thing and just mentioned self -harm. Someone came up and said, yeah, actually, um, it's a real epidemic here. Yeah, right. it's a real problem. Yeah. Thinking, what is going mm -hmm. on? And it's so upsetting. Can you imagine yeah. you're a parent, you oh, see well. a child of yours cutting <clears throat> their beautiful <clears throat> body, <throat> mutilating <throat> themselves. There's something desperately, <throat> desperately wrong. Um, thank you. And it's a really inspiring <clears throat> watch <clears throat> as well. Um, the the not-so-secret life of the manic depressive, 10 years on, airs on Monday, 9 o'clock on BBC One. Now, I have to say, there is a real joy in sitting and listening to a wonderful voice tell a story. And, listen, I've spent countless hours going up and down the M1 with my children, listening to your wonderful <laughs> dulcet tones, <laughs> talking us through the Harry Potter. Oh, it's been great. Well, uh, so, true. once upon a time, uh, we sent Keris, I can't do it quite like you, to meet the father <laughs> yeah. whose car journey stories became a worldwide bestseller. The flick of a tail, a cock of the head, a twitch of a nose. Sometimes it almost seems as if rabbits have a secret language all of their own. And no one has brought the world of rabbits to life quite like author Richard Adams in Watership Down, his classic novel about a group of bunnies who go on an epic journey to find safety in an all too dangerous world. Watership Down was first published in 1972. It became an instant literary phenomenon and was famously adapted into the much-loved 1978 animated film. Think it's safe now, Fiverr. Today, author Richard Adams is 95 years old and lives in Hampshire. He remembers creating the story for his daughters Roz and Juliet as if it was yesterday. Many years ago, when my daughters here were little, when we had to go on long car journeys, I used to tell stories, and on this particular journey, they asked for a good long story, and one that we have never heard before. <laughs> this obviously put me on the spot, and I started just off the top of my head. Once upon a time, there were two rabbits called Hazel and Fiverr. The little girl said, Daddy, you ought to write that down. That, that's, that's too good to, to waste. Watershed Down tells the story of a group of courageous rabbits who decide to leave their home after a premonition of coming danger and so begins a perilous quest to reach the safety of Watership Down. All the world will be your enemy, prince with a thousand enemies, and whenever they catch you, they will kill you. But first, they must catch you. Digger, listener, runner, prince with swift warning. Be cunning and full of tricks, and your people will never be destroyed. He read it to us in the evenings when we were going to bed, and we corrected it. My wife, she said, it'll frighten the children out of their lives. I, I said, good, good, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> children quite like a bit of scaring sometimes. Oh, Hazel, this is where it comes from. 
I know now something very bad, some terrible thing coming closer and closer. Now, Hazel, look, the field, it's covered with blood. When it was all finished, I set out and I left it with one publisher after another. And, you know, it was rejected seven times. But Adams persevered, eventually finding success with publisher Rex Collins. Rex Collins said, I like your story and I'd like to publish it. I thought, crikey. From then on, the book has never been out of print. One avid reader who fell under Watership Down spell during her childhood was our very own Miranda Kristofnikov. Miranda, I brought you here to the real-life Watership Down. And it is a real place as well. I was really surprised to find out that Watership Down is a real location. <laughs> anyway, how old were you when you first read the book? I think I was about nine or ten. Um, you read it on the sort of fantasy rabbit level. Yeah. Yeah. And then I came back to it as a teenager. And then you just get a whole other level. You don't really realise it, but you're learning a huge amount about rabbit society and rabbit behaviour. These little twitches and the nose and the ears and the scratching and the thumping and things like that. What's the legacy of a book like this? If you look around here, you know, I can, I can imagine the rabbits in this landscape. That's what the book does. It connects you with not just rabbit society, but, but I your think environment. The, the natural world in general. The book has been unexpected and successful beyond my wildest dreams. I, uh, I sometimes wake up wondering if it's real. I, I didn't plan it that way, I just planned it for them. Richard Adams's masterpiece went on to capture the hearts and minds of millions of readers around the globe. And to think it began as a story a father told for his two daughters in the back of a car. Ah, wonderful. <laughs> Very unfortunate choice of hat, that, wasn't it, from Keris? Uh, but there we are. Anyway, uh, Stephen, thank you for joining us thank tonight. You. And if you would like more information about the issues that Stephen was talking about, then please go to our website. Thanks also to Louise oh, for giving me company tonight. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, tomorrow, Alex will be back on this side of the sofa with Dermot O'Leary, and also Cuba Gooding Jr. will be here as well. Yes, so back to the old script writing, Stephen. Mm. Uh, Good luck. We, we look forward to seeing it yes. Sunday night. Thank Nine you very much. BBC One. But uh, that's all for now, so goodbye. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>